Welcome to the Last Beer Show. Cheers. Cheers. Happy New Year, man. Happy New Year, buddy. I don't drink. This isn't hazy enough for me. We had a couple of field works last night that were like totally not hazy at all. And uh, John Whitehill was joking around. He's like, I can't drink this. This doesn't have enough haze for me. It was field work. I Everybody's a haze go. snob now. Haze Why does snob. it smell like that's a tap piss, raccoon piss? Uh, that's because this is... Oh, hey, everybody. Welcome to the Last Beer Show. Hey, welcome to the Last Beer Show. What's up, Jason? Show. Hey. This is a German Pilsner. Pretty sure it's German. It smells very... Um, Yever. Jever. Yever, however you pronounce it. it smells um, very skunk. Skunk. It, it, uh, yeah, it's, it's really... This is one of the... What'd you give me? This is one of the ones you get after when you when you're getting after this style. This is one of the standards of the style. I don't know. It is bitter. It is uh, hoppy. Yeah. Thankfully, it doesn't taste as bad as it smells. It smells like skunk piss. Yeah, they don't always t- smell like well. Those green bottle beers don't smell <clears> great. Jeever. So this is out of uh, Germany. Yeah, it's good stuff, man. I love Pilsners, and this is one of the ones, uh, as long as it hasn't been sitting too long. This one has been sitting a while, so it's not quite as hoppy as they would normally be. 4.9%, so it's pretty low. Yeah, it's pretty easy going, easy drinking, good flavor. You can crush these with food, socially. That's yeah. it. Okay. You know, there just are not enough lagers in this world. Certainly not, certainly not in our world. And uh, and uh, that could be a thing we get into here. I I agree. Among other things, I actually think that um, one of the next big trends in craft beer for the new year will be lagers and pilsners. Twenty eighteen, you're calling it. You're calling your shot. Hazy, fuzzy pilsners, fruited, sour pilsners, <clears throat> and pilsner stouts, lager stouts, lagers and pilsners um, in the new year. I was I was thinking the other day about just lagering, switching to lagering with home brewing because I'm kind of at a loss of what I want to do next at home brewing from a home brewing standpoint. Yeah, I'm just racking my brain like design all these recipes that I'm just not that inspired to do. So I was thinking about getting back into lagering. I've done it. Um, if you don't have the right space or the right equipment, it is a hassle. It's a lot of work. We built this insulated box. And you put your fermenter down into it, and I have two f- two bottles, two liter bottles, like soda bottles, frozen. So you have four of total, two in the freezer, two in your box that have been frozen that you stick in the corners. And then twice a day, you got to swap those bottles out Yep. for six weeks. Tis true. It's a, uh, <laughs> it is a laborious undertaking. Which is why a lot uh, of breweries don't do lagering. But I got to tell you, it's the best beer we ever brewed. It was a stout. It was a lager stout called Coal Miner's Pilsner. Yeah. Uh, you look it up on the Brew Toad, you will see it's a fantastic recipe. It's Ribbit. totally crushable. It's totally doable. It wasn't that high grab. I think it was about 6%. And um, big chocolate, super dry, like those like Ghirardelli, like 73% cacao bars, where mm-hmm. you're like, whoa, that's dry and rich. Oh, yeah. Kind of like that. It was like that. It was like the beer version of that type of thing. Yeah. It's awesome. So uh, I I did a lager uh, myself. I did a lager here um, off the Pico Brew, um, and I bought a small fridge. Uh, last year, I brought a, bought a small fridge so that I could uh, lower the temps to do that. But then I also have the brew jacket, which will allow me to... Yeah, the jacket, that it's like this big sock. It goes around your fermenter, right? Mm-hmm. And it controls temperature. Yeah, but it also has it a... It goes down to like... a controller, yeah, with a... 40 degrees? With a rod. 45 degrees in that, that ballpark? That uh, cools it down to lagering temps so that you can nice. actually lager with it as well in an apartment or a small area where you don't have room for a big big cooler or another I was, refrigerator. I was not aware of that. It is. It's yep, awesome. So I am fully capable of lagering. Um, I just... Uh, you know, I've been playing with a bunch of other styles. Right. Um, we usually get into what have you had since the last show, but what if we opened this up a little bit more to be? Because I, I saw you tweet this, and we didn't we didn't get very many responses, if none is any. Then I would say that 
what was the best beer you had in uh, all of 2017 here as we say goodbye to that year and open up a new one? Yeah, it was a, it was obviously for the both of us, it was a, it was a year full of beers, full of beers. So out of all of the beers that we had, uh, I'd be interested to know what your favorite beer was in 2017. I mean, I know what mine was. I had it towards the latter part of the year and it was, it, it blew me away. Um, the best beer I had all year in 2017. Um, I know it. It is, the name is really hard to say. I'm going to pull it up here. One second. We need like hold music. I know. I can't imagine how bad that sounds in somebody's car speaker. Uh, It can't be that bad. Can't be? No way. We will see. Uh, I mean, I got into so many good ones. It's kind of hard to say, but I think I have a clear clear winner i'm gonna go with the orpheus brewing um the one with all the, the window like yeah. the but the chair by the window yeah, no and no one's sitting in one. it oh shit now i need to remember it. it's such a long name it's so good that beer was so good and what's funny is i had it at a tasting of but uh it's called like a white curtain blowing in the draft from a wind, half open window beside a chair on which nobody sits, which I'm pretty sure is like something straight out of a poem. These are the days of our lives. Something like that. So um, that beer was so incredibly good. I turned around after tasting it at the brewery and I bought like four bottles and uh, you still have one. I'm sitting on it. Uh, Cause it, it it's going to sell her just fine. And, uh, you know, we had it. I had it at a share again a few months later, and it just stood up so well to some of the absolutely classic sours and other big beers and, and really delicious sought after beers. It stood out so well without me having said anything. A couple of the people there were like, you know, which one really stood out to me? That one, which was like, yeah, I totally, totally get that. Um, so I will say that was the best beer I had. If you can still get your hands on a bottle of that, I would not hesitate. Uh, the value is very high. But I mean, look, Therafin the Recluse from my buddies at Three Taverns. I had a couple of Hill Farmsteads, a couple of Jester Kings, a couple of things from other breweries in the Northwest, all of which blew my socks off. It was such a tasty year that um, I'm just – Full of gratitude that I had the opportunity to get get my hands on all those things. Yeah. What else? What about you? Um, I'm gonna go with uh, my two my two top favorite beers of all of last year were what was last uh, snow. No. Oh, most. honestly, it, here's what's hard. What's hard is that the cherry um, wine. The Fredericks, uh, what is it, Fredrickson? Fredericks Doll Cherry Fredericks Wine. Fredericks Doll Cherry no. Wine. No? It was hard. There was Jeez, so much amazing beer guess. that came out last year. But um, the two beers I'm going to go with are uh, Monday Night Brewing's Tears of My Enemies, which was a 9.5% Scotch Barrel Milk Stout with uh, coffee, which was incredible. Uh, won a lot of awards this past year. Um, really the best, in my opinion, the best beer that Monday Night Brewing uh, out of Atlanta has ever brewed. Um, honestly, I, I, I probably had three bottles and I probably I, I didn't didn't get enough. And then the, the second bottle was uh, bottle was Bottle Logic's Fundamental Summation, which is um, uh, they're out of California. They're out of Anaheim. And it's uh, Imperial Stout aged in bourbon barrels. And it's finished with uh, vanilla beans and Jamaican Blue Mountain coffee beans. Man, I'm bumming. I didn't get my hands on either of those bottles. Uh, incredible. That fundamental summation might be one of the top three beers that I've ever had uh, in 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 all my life. Okay. Uh, just the nose on it alone. You could just sit and, and the aroma. You could just sit and sit with the, the aroma for mm-hmm. 
hours on end and just uh, without even drinking it and be satisfied. But then you drink it and it's this spectacular vanilla coffee. I mean, it's not overwhelmingly sweet. It's perfectly balanced. It's, it is, it's a perfect dessert stout. And, um, you know, these bottles go for, you know, around $120 right now uh, on the secondary market and they're, they're worth every penny of it for sure. Awesome. Yep. So that would that would be my top two from last year. Would you? What did you? Uh, what did you get into over the holidays? Anything specific like holiday beers, flavors, seasonal? Well, of course, uh, every year I'm a, I get into Prairie's Christmas Bomb. Yep. Uh, Prairie's Christmas Bomb, which is uh, their bomb um, made with spices. So it's. Uh, um, some people love it. Some people hate it. If you love spices in your beer, uh, you will love it. If you don't, you will probably hate it. But yeah, it's rich. I had uh, I actually just had a bottle of 2016 the other day. Yeah, so it's really really good. I've actually got a four year vertical right now that I'm sitting on, and um, I'd like to do them all side by side. Um, but that's a great beer, and then also. Um, uh, Jekyll's, uh, this is not promotional, but Jekyll's, uh, redneck Christmas stout, which is a, we had that on the last show, which is a, it tastes like a thin mint. It's yeah, a it was chocolate, really good. chocolate peppermint stout. So I had that. And then, uh, and then, uh, you know, I, over the holidays, I go to, uh, uh, the coast of South Carolina. Yep. Uh, and, uh, that means, uh, that always means a trip through Charleston, which has become a really amazing little craft beer mecca. If you haven't been to Charleston, yeah, and, sneaky, good beer town. Yeah. Really, really good hidden, hidden, um, gems there. If you haven't been there, there's, a uh, 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 Holy, uh, Holy city is there. They've got uh, Charleston fermentary. Westbrook is there. Um, there's a couple of other really good breweries in that area that are kind of up and coming. Edmonds Oast is now brewing their own beers. Oh, nice. And um, they Charleston is just really burgeoning as a craft beer community now. And so on the way in, I hit Westbrook, which is always good. And they've always got some really interesting, fun beers on. And then on the way um, on the way back home, I, I stopped through there and... Um, visited Charlestown Fermentary, which is uh, Charlestown Fermentary is a new brewery from Adam, who used to be the head brewer at Trillium, also spent some time at Tired Hands and uh, recently moved to Charleston to open up a brewery down there. And uh, I'm going to call it the Trillium of the South because really that's what it is. Trill South. It's it's Trill South uh, for sure. Uh, I had their Macer IPA and then their Palette Rider uh, Double IPA, which uh, you know I've mentioned that their Palette Rider Double IPA is easily the the best Double IPA I've ever had. Uh, it had notes of melon and cantaloupe. It was incredibly balanced and sweet, and um, you know l- nice bitter back end. It had that classic kind of Trillium. Um, kind of a uh, profile to it, which I really like, which is just a hint of bitterness on the back end. Mm-hmm. And uh, it was uh, amazing. So I did have some good beers while I'm down there, but that the area that my in-laws live in uh, Myrtle beach is a, you know, we, we talked about it as a craft beer desert beer really. desert. Yeah. So I did have some good beers. And then uh, of course I brought a bunch of really good beers back. There's a, a bottle shop. If you ever find yourself in Charleston, there is a bottle shop called, uh, uh, at, uh, well, originally it was a, a really cool kind of, um, uh, bar called Edmonds Oast. And, uh, they was, uh, started by, uh, the folks from the Charleston beer exchange, uh, who, uh, ended up closing the Charleston beer exchange and then basically moving the Charleston Beer Exchange, which was this amazing bottle shop uh, next door to their Edmonds Oast location. And it's easily one of the best bottle shops I've ever been to. It's not so much that they've got like millions of bottles. It's that the bottles that they have are just incredibly well thought out, like really amazing selection of like really well well chosen bottles right, it's not a filler beer store it's definitely not a filler beer store I, I could have bought everything that was in there and then there was a lot of really 
amazing rare stuff in there. There were there were there were uh, Tilkins uh, just sitting on the on the shelf. I mean, they're just it's unbelievable the kind of beers that they had just sitting on the shelf. So nice. Sounds uh, like a good shop. Scratch Brewing. Uh, they're out of Illinois. We've talked about them. Uh, Scratch yep. Brewing. They had a lot of their bottles. They've got a ton of Jester King. They they they're just a really amazing bottle shop. If you find yourself in Charleston, what are we getting into next? So uh, this is a Trogues Mad Elf, which is a yearly release for them. It's kind of their Christmas release. Um, it's an ale brewed with cherries, I believe. It's honey a, and cherries. Yeah, honey and cherries. It's around eleven percent. Um, it usually drinks really sweet and rich. Uh, kind of reminds me a little bit of. Um, um, a little bit of a dark cherry ale, I guess. Yeah, I can see that. Yeah, it's really kind of sweet. Fairly dry. The cherry's not that pronounced. We'll see when we get a little bit further into it. Um, we got a couple other bottles to get into here. We got some something from, um, what is it? Prairie Ales. Yeah, we've got, we've, I put a Prairie Christmas bomb in here. Good um, people. I've also got a, a, a can of a Jay Wakefield Laser Sweet Stout with coffee and chocolate. Jay Ooh. Wakefield is out of Florida. Yeah, nice. Um, this is a can that I picked up at Edmonds Oast. Um, uh, again, we don't get distribution for Jay Wakefield uh, in Georgia yet. And then you also brought along a Good People Denim Downhiller Winter Ale. Uh, from good people in Birmingham. I liked that one. I'm excited about trying it. Yeah. Um, so last time we talked, we talked quite a bit about some of the big releases that were about to drop, the KBS and the CBS specifically. Um, and, you know, tis the season. A lot of big beers start dropping, you know, in, in the fall. So I thought instead of talking about a style in this one, we could talk a little bit about cellaring. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I know that brings in, you know, other topics, you know, it rubs up against, uh, you know, collecting secondary market and certainly, uh, you know, long-term storage and, and some of those solutions. We don't need to get into details of all of it, but I wanted, uh, you know, since you're a guy who really collects a lot of beers, um, I thought that it would be cool to kind of share a little bit of the experience around cellaring itself because i don't know that we've really touched on that before yeah there was there there was actually an article that came out recently about you know why i'm not cellaring anymore i saw that and it was an interesting article but then i I noticed uh just yesterday a follow-up article to that on how well he kept his word and it appears he he didn't keep his word that well um you know here's the reality the reality is a lot of these big beers that I trade for or that I buy or that I, you know, that I seek out are big beers. You know, they're usually pretty high ABV beers. They're usually big format bottles and I can't drink these by myself. And they have rich ingredients like chocolate and coffee or spices or heat. And, and they need time to mellow out sometimes to be, to get to a point of balance. Exactly right. So between the two of those, between the, the high alcohol, which needs some time to balance out. So like I'm looking at uh, one of my coolers now and inside of there, there's some worldwide stouts from Dogfish Head. There's some 120 minutes from Dogfish Head. Those beers have to have some age on them to settle out or they're just incredibly too hot to, almost to drink. They're yeah. almost undrinkable when they're yeah. fresh. So between the high alcohol that needs some time to kind of mellow out and meld with the other flavors of the of the bottle and some of these other bottles that are just they're too big to drink by themselves because they're too rich and sweet. And, you know, I'm thinking about beers like, you know, um, uh, Angry Chair out of Florida or Psycho Brewing or, you know, some of these real rich kind of sweet beers that, you know, are full of adjuncts and um you know, they're not beers that I could drink by myself. Sure. And so what that means is I work really hard to get a lot of these beers and then I have to wait until I have enough people over here to open it up and drink it. Right. And so that leads to cellaring. So cellaring is a natural byproduct of that. And the other thing that happens too is that you may buy a, a bunch of these at one time. Maybe you go to a score a store like Edmonds Oast and you you score a lot of these bottles at one time. You know, now all of a sudden you have all these bottles. You can't drink them right away. Right. So you're going to need to cellar them. And so 
cellaring is a natural byproduct of kind of the culture that we're in, which is almost kind of like um, I've I've likened it to the baseball cards, you know, of my childhood, you know, because we're, we're trading these bottles back and forth. We, we have specific ones. I'm looking for the Michael Jordan rookie card. You know, I'm looking for the 2012 Dark Lord, you know, and it, in a similar way to how we, how we were with baseball cards, we are now with craft beer. And so because of that, you know, again, you're going to see a lot of cellaring. And so, um, there are some things to note about cellaring, though. Obviously, the higher the alcohol, the better the beer se- uh, sellers. Um, the lower the alcohol, the the lower they seller. And the other thing is, uh, when you're t- thinking of cellaring, what style of beer is it? You know, is it an IPA? If it's an IPA, but different ingredients uh, age differently and last longer. Yep. Have a better shelf life. That's right. Where hops don't have a very good shelf hops life. Hops don't have a very good shelf life. But when I think of sours, goozes, lambics, sort of these these beers, you know, they're kind of they're made for aging. But even uh, a fairly low ABV, say a lambic, like you mm-hmm. you mentioned, or uh, some of these fruited beers, they actually sell her pretty well, even though they're fairly low grav. Now That's you're right. not going to get the kind of time you will out of them like you would say a big Belgian. Or you know a big dogfish head beer um, that it and you can sit on a Saint Bernard Sap twelve for years you know eight years easy yep and whereas where's a four percent fruited beer you're not going to want to sit on that for more than a year or two it's and an, and another thing to think about too when you're thinking about that is you know I'm looking at a couple of these beers on my shelf now that are they're they're fully loaded with adjuncts. Well, those adjuncts will fade out in time. So if the, some of these beers have like have uh, coffee and coconut in them. Mm-hmm. The longer that the that 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 beer sits on that shelf, the, the more faint. the more yeah. the, the, those flavors become faint, and um, they don't necessarily make the best um, for cellaring as well. Matter of fact, um, you know I you know we've as we've talked about last snow is one of my favorite beers from Funky Buddha, which is a coffee coconut. I like to pick on you for that one, but. I, I don't mind. It's true. It. it is true. But that beer, uh, they recommend it, and they actually say it on the bottle that you drink it fresh. But I've drank that beer in a year, and it to me, it's it's just as good um, as as when it's fresh. Sure. So, with that being said, I don't get any of the coffee. Coffee is one of those flavors that tends to fade out pretty quickly. So, just take those things into notice. Um, uh, what you sell her is just as important, you know, and, you know, obviously some people, matter of fact, uh, Westbrook, I'm looking at the Westbrook Mexican cake and Ooh. I think they say it on their bottle as well to drink fresh, drink not it to fresh. sit on it. Um, well, because that one has uh spice. Yeah, it does. Mm-hmm. So I imagine that, that, that spicy heat, not the alcohol heat, but the spicy heat will definitely fade over time. Yeah. So, yeah, you know, some of these things, um, and I want to mention, I want to go back to CBS and KBS, uh, uh, specifically um, CBS from Founders and KBS from Goose Island. Um, those were big releases. No, KBS is Founders. And did, I have, did I invert that? Bourbon County Stout. From- Bourbon County Stout, that's it. So, mm-hmm. so um, these things were like really hard to get for years on end. And then there were big releases and it seems like everyone panicked and rushed out and lined up. And and got as many as the store would sell them, which usually wasn't very many, two, three, four bottles. And then they would drive around the stores all day. Like people took the day off from work. I know a few people that did. Yeah, follow trucks. And yeah, and just like basically the store was like, okay, here's your number. You can have three of this flavor and one special one kind of a thing. Or you can have four bottles and that's it. Um, and they would just hit all the shops in town. And then it seems like, Unlike previous years where that really was the strategy, now this year or this this season, it was entirely different. Like everyone did that. And then a week later, more showed up. And the week after that, even more showed up to the point where now I've seen them on shelves. Yeah. I've seen them on shelves that, you know, you compared it to some of the other ones that used to be fairly rare uh, in, in a, you know, when we were getting yeah, pre-gaming. Brooklyn, Brooklyn Black Ops. Mm-hmm. 
Uh, we talked about Rodenbach Alexander. Yeah, another one. Mm-hmm. They used to be really tough to get. It's an amazing, fantastic beer. And then all of a sudden now you can get all these beers. So now I got uh, the founders. Uh, was it CVS? Uh, just in the, sh- in the shop this past Friday, I just grabbed them. Yeah. So, uh, w- you know, we, uh, we, and this is something that we talked a little bit about. Um, before we went live too, is that there's a couple of factors here. One of those factors is that for Bourbon County Stout, which is owned by, uh, which is made by Goose Island and owned by AB InBev, um, obviously they can make as much of that as they want. They They're have, not they limited have by unlimited anything. resources. They, they have barrels on barrels on barrels and barrels. They've got warehouses and warehouses. They could put out, they could put it out weekly if they wanted to, right? Right. So. Obviously, you know, they, there's not as much a, a limit. Um, there's not as much a limited kind of thing for that. And, the, and one of the other things that has affected Bourbon County Stout is there are a lot of people, and my friends included, who won't buy it now because it's, um, because they're owned by AB InBev, right? So you, you'll naturally see more surplus on shelves. I was in, again, I was in South Carolina last week and I went into a, 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 a beer store. Um, just in a small town in South Carolina, and there were two cases of it sitting on the shelf. The, the like, Goose Island? G- the Goose Bourbon Island, County? yeah, Bourbon County mm-hmm. Stout, the regular one, um, just a week ago. And it, and it came out Black Tuesday. And, and as you remember, when it used to come out on Black Tuesday, there were lines and people were lotteries and things. And oh, yeah, it was insane. It was insane, and people couldn't get it. So similar, um, you know, similar things. Things have happened with other um, beers where they pr- just uh, either produce a lot more or they get bought by someone else like Wicked We got bought by uh, AB InBev. InBev. And now, now there's a surplus of those beers on the shelves. Right. And that's the first thing. And founders sold 30% stake to um, private equity. They did, but I don't think that, that that's affected them at all. I don't think that what founder did founders did has really affected them. I think, and this is just my opinion, um, and I, and I, the reason why I say that is because I noticed it with some of the advertising that, that happened before CBS came out. I think they knew they were putting a lot of it into the market. I think that they said, Hey, that, you know, because of the secondary market, because of, um, what they've learned from KBS and what they've learned from CBS, which again has only come out, you know, once every four or five years. Right. Um, they dropped a lot of it into the market at one time. Like you mentioned, a store here in Atlanta got three drops of it, which is unbelievable. Yeah, in consecutive really. weeks. Never, uh, previously unheard of. So, yeah, and the next one I'm looking forward to uh, seeing how things change would be uh, Hop Slam, mm-hmm. yep. which drops uh, from Bells, right? That drops every February, I think, late February. Yep. Uh, so uh, I know they're canning that uh, exclusively this year. No, I think they did well the draft, obviously. But um, that's always been a beer that's been highly sought after and very difficult to get. And you have to drink that right away, right? It's a double IPA. You yeah, drink that right, right away. Mm-hmm. So it'll be interesting to see uh, how that changes because Bell's, like founders, took on private equity. Right. But I, I remember some of the... I remember some of the conversation last year when uh, Hop Slam came around, around uh, Hype Slam... I'm not buying it. Oh this year. no! Now you're you're perfect segue. This is exactly where I'm going with this conversation. Is how good does hype taste? Exactly. How good is Bourbon County? How good is CBS? When it's rare, it's better. Like we saw it with Tropicalia from the Creature Comfort guys. We've seen it with Hop Slam last year when there was finally enough in the market, and people were like, you know what? It might not be as good as we remember. Is it as good as the great other similar beer down the street? Because the difference between the Bourbon County Stout and, say, a really great stout from your local brewery, is it is it $40 difference? Is it a $20 difference? Is it a $5 difference? Because it, there, it's a $25 dis- discrepancy in those bottles. Right. Off the shelf. Right, one's going to be thirty thirty five dollars because it's rare, and they know everybody's going to line up for it. And then one is just on the shelf for ten bucks, eight bucks because it's readily available. Right, 
I'm collecting dust now for two weeks. So I don't know what that hype and how it affects our perception of how tasty these bottles are. Well, so, I mean, that's something that I've heard of, uh, that the hype effect that I've heard of, and I've heard people complain about for years, and it's related to beers like Pliny and Hetty and Zombie Dust and mm -hmm. Bourbon County Stout and even down to local beers um, here in the Atlanta area. I hear people complain about beers that, you know, are hyped up. And it's interesting to me because usually when I hear about beers that are hyped up, it's from other people who are drinking beers. It's never really from the breweries themselves. Right. It's from people who genuinely like beer. So is it genuinely hype if a bunch of people who really like it talk about how much they really like it? Right. I don't think so. Now, with that being said, have I had beers before that I've hyped up in my head and then I drank it and I was like, oh, well, that was that was okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I would say that for sure. I would say that absolutely a, a certain beer uh, IPA on the West Coast that I hyped up in my head and then I had it and I was like, okay, it's good, but it's definitely not what I not what I had. It's not life changing. Head. And so I think there is a certain perception of that. And what would be an even even in, more interesting conversation is how that goes and relates to beer ratings and things like Untapped. Because right. I know that the number one uh, ranked beer in the world right now is KBBS from Toppling Goliath, which, as you know, I actually got to try last year. Right, yeah. I won the lottery uh, last year to, to purchase it. Um is that beer number one because it is the best beer in the world? Or is it number one because of the hype behind it and the rarity and scarcity of that beer? I don't know. Is it the Michael Jordan card? Is, you know? it, is it lack of availability? Scarcity creates value, right? right. It, it does it in Bitcoin. It does it with baseball cards. And it does it with beer. Yep, that's right. And uh, I think if it was readily available, it may not be rated as high. Yeah, I I agree. So, you know, and I, I read a, a, a very interesting story um, a few months ago that talked about how um, how how this rarity and scarcity has affected beer ratings. And it talked about how, you know, 10 years ago, you know, the number one ranked beer was something like Westy 12. You know, or oh, that's good. you know, which is which is <laughs> amazing. Twelve is so good, but it's probably not even in the top ten right now, right? Because it's full of these really, you know, whales right. as we call them, and it, it, a Westy twelve is like number fifteen or something stupid. So it's it is a very interesting conversation, but I think one of the things that that we that we can take away from it, and one of the things that's a plus from it, is the fact that man, while we are all chasing these whales, these, you know, Dark Lord, KBBS, these kind of really, you know, super high, um, super low quantity beers. There are a lot of amazing beers just sitting on shelves now. Collecting dust, like this Jeever. Like, like Jeever, Matt, like Matt Alf, like at, at, uh, at $8 Alexander. six pack. $8 six pack collecting dust on the shelf of that German Pilsner that is awesome. Yeah, so... I think that we as consumers really win because uh, while we're all, like I said, while we're all chasing trucks and doing these things, there's a lot of amazing beer that's just sitting on shelves and we have the ability to drink it. And there's a lot of mediocre beer too. We'll, but we'll dispute that, but there are a lot of amazing beers that just sit on shelves now. I think what is, what is mediocre I'm not sure how to say this. Sentences are getting more difficult. Has changed. Uh, what qualifies as mediocre has changed. I think it's improved. Well, I mean, obviously. I think the last, I think the last well, I, it's always been the case. I mean, craft beer, independent beer, brewing industry period has really matured a lot. It's grown it used to grow exponentially. Now it's growing still at a very fast clip. Uh, the number of breweries is always increasing as it gets more competitive, more styles start to trend and we start getting more experimentation and more creativity. And that's just good for the whole game. And I think that that affects 
the run of the mill barrels beers, right? The the extra pale ales and the base IPAs and the flagships are affected because the brewers are getting more talented. The consumers are get, their palates are improving. The whole chain of consumption, I think, is is gets stronger. Yeah, I agree with you. So it's a win win for consumers. Um, although a lot of people really start to bitch that pricing is getting into wine territory. But we talked about this a year ago. We called it. You called it. Our buddy Chris over at Creature Comforts called it. And when we, as consumers, become more comfortable with the idea that different products have different value and that every six pack shouldn't be 10 bucks, yeah, then I think we really start getting into a much higher quality product because then they can start using ingredients and processes that can have a, a better effect, a stronger effect on the, on the product itself. And that's a conversation that I have. That's a conversation that I have uh, almost every day running social media for a brewery, which, you know, has a 16 ounce uh, Northeast style IPA that sells for $4 for a 16 ounce can. And, you know, there are a lot of people that are conditioned to paying X amount for 12 ounce cans who are like, man, that's a lot of money. But again, uh, when you allow the uh, higher costs, which, you know, these beers have five pounds of hops per barrel, they're double dry hop, they take more time. Mm -hmm. If you'll give us a little bit more money for that beer, we can put a lot more quality and a lot more uh, craftsmanship into that can. And and we're just learning that as a consumer base, I think, whereas wine has known this for a hundred years. We're so far behind wine. People don't hesitate to spend $40 on a bottle of wine and $65 for that same bottle in a restaurant. There's four glasses. Yeah. Right? Five if you're going to short pour. That's it. It's essentially $60 for a four pack, $30 for a four pack. An average bottle of wine, those four four packs, I mean, outside of three-buck chuck and some of these things that you get at discount stores, most bottles of wine are going to cost you $10, $15 for a national brand, right? Woodbridge, Yellowtail, these things. If they're on sale, they're 8 bucks. If they're not, they're 12 Their reserve stuff is going to be 16 right? Yep, that's right. So to me, that is a, a $16 four-pack of a high-quality beer or a... $15 six pack of a high quality beer is absolutely in line with that base pricing of cheap wine. Mm-hmm. Yep. But you're getting the best beer, which funnily enough, you walk into a restaurant and everyone has a really nice glass of wine, but their beer selection is garbage. And then when you do order it, they have no clue about glassware. They just give you like either a frozen pint glass or basically like a Tom Collins <laughs> right, they give you like yeah. a Tom Collins glass and your your bottle of local average pale ale, which was your only choice outside of light, tasteless lager. Yep, that's right. Right, so they you we we're still asking to be treated that way. So I just saying. Yeah, I agree. We with you. we have to mature. I agree with you. Uh, and I think that consumers are getting there. I do think that it is. Um, uh, I do think that it is. Um, you know, it is a slow battle. I think there's a lot of overcoming that we've had to do. What I'm hoping to see is as these specialty beers increase in price, and the breweries are getting it, you know, making appropriate appropriate margins with those. What happens is their flagship run of the mill ales actually come down in price. Yeah. What, are you, what are you doing? I'm listening. You you're not listening, you're typing. No, you said their flagship beers will go down go in price. Go down in I'm price. I'm up beers like Tropicalia and things like that. These things can come down in price because they're buying now in bulk as they grow. There's different opportunities from a manufacturing process right. that that can affect that margin. Like maybe they want to keep the margins where they're at, but they maybe they don't want to put a product that creates a perception that there are cheap beers under their brand, all different arguments that are totally valid to make. But 
I wouldn't mind seeing that happen where there was total accessibility from a couple of the labels on the brand and then high end stuff, right? Yeah, I agree with you. You got your Toyota, you got your Lexus, you got your Ford, you got your Lincoln. I mean, you know, some of that has to do with, you know, your increased ability to buy hops at different prices and lock in different hop contracts. And Mm -hmm. there's all kinds of packaging. There's all kinds of different ways that that helps for sure. Yeah. I'm just saying Mm -hmm. we'll keep an eye out. I agree. We could be, we could be a year ahead of our time again. I wouldn't complain about that. Every year we'll do a show where we're like clear. We show our clairvoyance. Yeah. That would be amazing. (laughs) That wouldn't be amazing. (laughs) Like Nostradamus. Beer, Beer Stradamus. Yeah. So, when you're done answering emails... I'm not answering emails. What the hell are you typing? I'm listening. You're writing dissertation over there. No, I'm not. Dude. All right, I don't know how to segue into the other stuff we have on the... Because it gets heavy after this. Let's do it. You want to just bail? Or you want to do it? Let's do it. All right. Tell me about your buddy at Dystopian State Brewery. Oh, it's not my buddy. Wait, this is a news. This is a news segment. Well, let's talk about brewery brewing it's not news. My buddy. Yeah, yeah. We need like a. Yeah, we're not going to talk about the local option. We're just going to talk about this. Uh, I mean, it's the same story. Yeah, but I'm not going <laughs> to. It is gonna... almost identical story. I know it is, but I'm not going to. I don't want to deal in rumors. I want to just deal with what has been published. Yeah. So I would rather just talk about dystopian. State because it's news that's uh, being talked about around the the industry. There are memes. There are memes. There are entire memes about spitting your beer. There are uh, se- back I've seen in several today. Back, what did he say? Back into your boyfriend's mouth. Yeah. So this apparently is a really nice guy out in uh, Tacoma, Washington, uh, a brewery called Dystopian State. The owner and head brewer found himself suspended from the company, from the facilities uh, for lashing back someone who went. Uh, went online and said the beer was so bad, I uh, I spit it back into the glass. Right. Which, you know, not a d- tasteful critique of the beer. Exactly, not helpful. But certainly, if he doesn't like it, that's his opinion. Um, to which the owner absolutely lashed out Uh inappropriately and said honestly can't read half of this stuff yeah you can't read it without getting an explicit next to our uh next in in itunes um but but it was unprofessional and i think that we've seen this happen with other breweries yeah and And i've experienced it myself you think that they would they would they would learn breweries i know breweries don't um i know they talk but they don't air any dirty laundry of other breweries. Breweries keep things in-house, right? That's right. Um, they don't stop other breweries from naming things like they're jerks. They don't stop breweries from however they want to handle their operations, um, no matter how sexist or misogynist or homophobic. Um, you won't see a lot of them speak out. Which is weird because when it comes to ingredients and creativity and growing the industry, you know, the whole concept of rising tide rises, raises all boats. Right. Like they're all in when it, the brotherhood is alive and real when that's the case. But when things go south, all of a sudden it's total hush. It's like nobody rock the boat. This guy's rocking the boat. We're just going to like, if they ignore him, it'll go away. Yeah. Which is, it's an odd dichotomy there. So, you know, I- I've, I've thought a lot about this because when I when when someone first surfaced this story about dystopian t- state to me, um, I read through it and I just thought, holy crap, that's going to leave a mark because uh, it's really hard to come back from from a situation like this where the owner actually goes after and attacks a customer based on on his opinion of uh, of his beverages. Um, like I said, I've actually I've had an owner of a brewery actually kind of come after me in a 
you know, sarcastic way about one of my reviews and I messaged him privately. We, we took it offline mm-hmm. and I told him that that wasn't acceptable. And We've covered this. We, we talked this very about good. it. So I've had that happen to me. And, uh, and as someone who handles untapped for a brewery, I could certainly see how the, um, how it would be tempting, right? But I also know that that never ends well. And I also know that it's in poor taste. And I also know that at the end of the day, you know, their opinion is their opinion and everyone is, has an opinion and it, it may or may not be valuable to you based on lots of different um, right. kind of parameters. Right. So you just have to let that go. And, uh, the owner, uh, messaged this guy. We're, and again, we're not going to read all of these because I can't read. Well, he them said, all. well, spit it back in your, uh, he, he boyfriend's said, mouth, you piece that, of crap. Yeah. Spit that back in your boyfriend's mouth, you piece of S H I T. Right. That was the first of a, a profanity laden message stream that, uh, lasted 10, 12 messages. And from what I read, uh, he actually reached out to the gentleman that he originally um, spewed this to and personally apologized and said, you know, he, it was a momentary, you know, momentary uh, lapse of reason, lapse of reason and, and record, and whatever. Right? And the, the gentleman who he lashed out at was actually very gracious and said, Hey, I've accepted his apology. You know, go, nice. go to the brewery and let the beers, you know, do, do the judging for you. The guy who he lashed out against has actually been very gracious who hasn't been very gracious are all the people who have read these comments and made the the decision for themselves that that's not something that they would tolerate. Well, you know that stuff's going to rebound. You know that the guy who made the comment might have between like most people 50 and 200 followers on any given social media thing, right? Now probably you have more Facebook friends, LinkedIn that one's a big one too. But when you when you're commenting on LinkedIn on 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 Untapped or even on Facebook within a small group you, it's only a few people that are going to see it. They might even chat about it for a day, but it's going to go down. It's going to fall and die in the list of streams of things that people are really commenting about, right? Whether it That's is right. the news of the day is going to bury it. So by commenting on it, the brewery has thousands of followers and people who are interested in what they have to say and share. The moment you make an incredibly inflammatory comment like that, you're the one who gave it legs. That's right. So now he's dealing with a justified backlash of people going, you said what? Right. I liked you. Yeah, they were actually a really well-liked uh, community brewery in the area. Yes. They were known for being family-friendly. and So now those people are going to take it just as personal because they had aligned their public persona with your brand. Right. Your brand helped define the cool things that they appreciated in the world, in their community. Right. And you broke that. You broke that trust. Yeah. And now he's dealing with that. Yeah. So it's a, it's an interesting thing. That's uh, something that a lot of people are talking about. So don't comment on it. Bruce. So just, uh, let, just it let it go. Let's, Honestly, let let's, it go. It'll die. Let's dog lie. It, it will die. Is that what they say? Yep. Yeah. I think that's a really, really good advice you have there, buddy. Uh, you know, along those lines, I saw, and these guys are just killing it these days, the Good Bear Hunting folks. Uh, I guess it's more of a magazine than a blog, really? An e-zine? What would you call that? What's that? Goodbearhunting.com. Good Bear Hunting, yeah, I would yeah, call it a should totally e-zine, it. I guess. So um, they published a piece, it was sort of an expose, if you will, on, uh, you know, the underground, you know, good old boys club that is all of these brewery staff members, you know, on the brewing teams. Um, and this isn't to say now we've talked to brewers. We'd have, we've, we've had people on the show in recent months that were, that are brewers at breweries. And we've talked to people at some of the breweries mentioned in the article. And, uh, this isn't to say that all brewers have that kind of attitude or they put, uh, misogynistic and homophobic graphics up on their Instagram. But basically what they had done and what the article on Good Bear Hunting calls out is called, the article is called, I Know What Boys Like, A Grassroots Industry Struggles to Find a Leadership on Social Issues. So some of the breweries that hadn't put down steadfast social media policies have found that some of their teams have gone and created alternative brand, alternative Instagram accounts 
the bulk of it happens on Instagram, where they go in and they say, "Oh, look at our sh- shenanigans in the brew in the brew floor," and some of the shenanigans are, you know, bad dick jokes and really jokes done in poor There's taste. A lot of crass stuff. A lot of very ugly things, and and some of the breweries are good breweries with people we know work there, and there's some good people there. Um, but that doesn't that doesn't make it okay because when you read the article, you really start to see, oh, geez. And it really does get into some of the gender and racial issues that you and I have tried to blow a horn for here right? for months now. We've been saying for months, you've got to diversify your teams. You've got to have people in the tasting room of all shapes, colors, sizes, creeds, and all this stuff. Like we've We've been saying this. And it's interesting to see that being said, uh, with a similar take, though clearly they're real journalists. They did uh, the writer um, uh, Brian Roth did a much better job than than we could possibly do covering this. No offense to you, you're obviously a brilliant man. Well, I mean, but- I thought I thought <laughs> I did like our conversations with those affected by it uh, a little bit better than just a one sided kind of thing. But, yeah, but yeah. I, well, we but I loved it. Don't get me. Well, wrong. we brought them to the table. Like they've gotten some feedback both constructive and negative around the article from the breweries mm-hmm. who felt like they didn't have an opportunity to respond. Um, but I don't think that they all had to be given an opportunity to respond before the article posted. Some of them knew about these accounts and weren't watching them. Some of them didn't know about the accounts and have been blindsided and they have every right to be upset. Um, but I think that you just can't go doing that kind of thing as a team. When you work somewhere, you represent that brand when you're in public. Mm-hmm. Like it or not, if the people know you work there, right? Nobody knows where I work. I don't represent the brand when I'm doing this. But if they did and I talked about where I worked, I would represent the brand. Period. Yep. Because people know I work there. How I act, it's associated with them. Um, so I, it's, it is a long, long read. It's gotta be, I don't know, 2,500 words. It's a long article, but it's a long article, but it's, and it's actually chewy. But it's so thorough. It's so thorough. It's very chewy. It's not an article that you can just kind of glance through. You, I literally found myself having to slow down just so I could actually digest what was being said in, in article. Yeah. I don't know if it's, it's not really skimmable. It's definitely Um, not skimmable. But I liked a lot of the takes of some of the people that commented. Uh, they really, I thought, did a good job journalistically of, of trying to cover it thoroughly and talk a little bit about why some of these things go on. And they talked about the culture of uh, craft beer and the perception of craft beer culture uh, in lower income communities and uh, how that, how it all comes back around to being full circle. Like you, it's going to be hard to break the perception that the high-end beer or craft beer or independent beer, whatever you want to call it, uh, industry isn't just for um, you know, middle-class white people. It's going to be hard to break that when you've got middle-class white people acting this way because it makes the entire thing, I believe, distasteful. Interacting with it just doesn't look like, well, that doesn't include me or that can't include me. Which I, it's not. It's not the case. We know lots of people who who participate in the community and are productive and are wonderful and contribute and are, are helping it in so many ways. And are not bearded white males. They're not bearded white males. Yep, I agree. Right. Uh, so, you know, I think at first when I read it, I had some frustration. I'm like, we're trying to do this work to to help the community and contribute to the community in some way, and then. These jerks go in and they do this kind of thing and just make it, they undo some of it. Like they just blow some of it for us. I was, a little, I was a little frustrated, but as I got into it, I realized, well, there's a social structure behind this that is unwritten, not seen by everyone. And I think this is growing pains. I want, I want to chalk it up as growing pains as a learning opportunity, an opportunity to have uh, conversations about things that, we hadn't had before. Yeah. 
So uh, one of the things that I would recommend that you do is um, I'm going to recommend because uh, I'm going to put links to both of these articles we just talked about, by the way, in the show notes. I think um, I think people should should follow them and, and read it and chew on it and 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 decide for themselves. Yeah. Well, one of the things that, um, you know, I, I, I pulled up the Good Beer Hunting Twitter account just to kind of see some of the other conversations. That's happening. Oh, it is Fire. Well, there's actually a really good conversation and thread right now by Libby Kreider, who is one of the co-owners of Second Shift yes. Brewing. She's responded very well, very productively. And it's a 10-part thread that I really think you should read if you care at all about any of this. And she starts off, well, she starts off by saying she's not going to respond to any ads. She's not interested in having a Twitter conversation. If you want, to she doesn't want a Twitter call, fight. She's just saying what she has to say. She's more than happy to do that. But she, but she says first of, of all, this article in which our brewery is mentioned is very well written. Any objector reader would applaud this. And um, you know, she talks about how it, it, uh, you know, it's disheartening to see her brewery mentioned. And you know, she talks about you know how frustrating it is that this account was included. But she is obviously a woman co-owner of a brewery and Mm -hmm. this obviously affects her and it affects how people view her in her brewery and i feel like these conversations really need to be swallowed and digested and not necessarily commented to so you know you talked about like how some of these breweries feel slighted because they didn't have an opportunity to kind of to kind of talk about i feel like this is another one of those listening moments in our time right where we just sit back and listen we need to listen and I don't really have to say anything about it. I just I need to listen and understand um, a different perspective or what's being happened because I may not I may not um, have been able to see it or could see it um, otherwise. Right? Sure, sure. You say that now after I said my piece. I I agree. I, mean, <laughs> I, I feel like this is for me at least. You know, when I when I started reading Libby's words, I realized. Uh, I just need to shut up and listen to her because she obviously is, uh, she's first of all uh, a woman. She's second of all a co-owner of a brewery that's mentioned in the article. And what she says is incredibly valuable. But I feel like there's a lot of these conversations that happen. And then I go back to our conversation on our previous podcast with um, the the women of craft beer that, right. we, that we had here. And the fact that, you know, there's, there is, we know these things to be true because we have heard firsthand on how they affected these, the women that sat at this table. Right. And so the question becomes, um, you know, what do we do with it? Right. Well, uh, and I see now I'm looking at it that, uh, the owner, uh, editor, owner or whatever of, uh, good beer hunting, uh, Michael Kaiser has gone in and put in a note just a, a couple of hours ago um, sort of a preface, uh, not to update the article, but, uh, to kind of give some context around some of the, some of the dialogue going on around the article. And it, it's really good. It's really good. I highly recommend, uh, reading through that. Uh, you know, we taught, we covered it. Uh, we covered a few things actually, um, in, in, in a couple of, couple of previous episodes, what was it? Um, we haven't done much cross-episode promotions, so I'm not very good at this. Bear with me. But we had uh, Women of Craft Brew on, where we talked to Zuri Coleman, who's a brewer, uh, Kathy Davis, who's an owner and brewer, and Jessica Miller, who is in marketing for a brewery, right? right. Uh, that is episode 11. Go back and check that out. We also talked on, uh, I believe it was, was it episode 10? Is the episode before that, right? Yes. Yeah. Episode 10, we talked to uh, three gentlemen. Joel Franklin. Joel Franklin. Jason Jones. Jason Jones. Eric Jackson. Eric Jackson. About um, being a minority male and being black male in, in the craft beer space. And we really thought that that was some really great conversations. Um, where we were trying to do some of the things that, this article kind of hits it with a hammer, mm-hmm. uh, and, but a very fine hammer, like a very fine point, it, and it really tries to back into some of the things that 
we wanted to get into and try to get into and hopefully got into to some degree in that episode. So go back and check out those episodes, 10 and 11, uh, where we cover some of that, if you have not listened to those before. And uh, I will practice cross-promotional episode reading. Yeah. And and maybe I'll get better at that one day. Yeah, maybe we all will. <laughs> those are great episodes, honestly. I actually tweeted out to... They're long. Look, they're, when you have three guests, it takes almost an hour to warm up. They're to incre- introduce everybody, it took 40 minutes. Incredibly, uh, they get to be incredibly chewy themselves. There's a lot of really heavy stuff that needs to be talked about in conversations that really need to be had. And um, I actually uh, I tweeted to Michael thanking him for posting the um, the article, to letting him know that we too, oh, nice. we too, I uh, tweeted him from from our account. Actually. From our account, yeah, we've letting done, him. We've know. reached out to him and said we've, we're trying to do. We, we, do this we're too. right there with you, man. Yeah. We we see these as conversations that need to be happening. Um, we 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 agree. We've talked to people who have said these are conversations that need to happen, and uh, we're we were saying amen, right? Right. So I mean, they don't need to be right. I don't need to be right. Right. At the outset, I just want to be right when we come out of it. Yeah. Like I just wanted to have a, a thorough understanding of of what is appropriate. My gut tells me what I think is appropriate, but I'm not going to claim that I can see that from here. Yep, I can't. I can't claim that. I don't have those experiences. But uh, anyway, that that's what's happening in beer news. <laughs> I don't know, I just try it. I need to get some. I get a sound effects button. It's good. I've been I've been threatening to do that for a while now. Maybe I should just. <laughs> we could do another thing where you rap. That was the news. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Uh, so, listen. Let me let me look see how long we've been going here. <coughs> what is that? I thought your cough was gone. <coughs> we've talked about this. We've been going an hour. Let's just bail. Done. You good? I'm good. I'm good. Let's crack open another beer. Oh, you did? You try the um the downhill? Yeah, I did. I already drank half of it. Good people. Yeah, it's, it's good, good, right? It's good. good it kind of it's not seasonal. People. It's not seasonally spicy. Like I thought, oh, seasonal spices, but I'm going to give it a try because Christmas was coming. And I wanted something with seasonal spices. I get a hair every once in a while to do that kind of thing. Uh, and I drank it. I was like, wait, this is a solid English ale. Yeah. It's brown. It's good. Do All right, brown. listen. Have a nice month. Yeah, you too. Love you, buddy. Hey, thanks, man. Peace. Have a great one. Thanks, everybody. If you have a question or something you would like us to discuss, drop us an email, sip at lastbeershow.com or hit us on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook at The Last Beer Show. A reminder that we are proud members of the ABV Network. Go to abvnetwork.com to see all the amazing podcasts or go to your podcast app of choice. Search for something like The Last Beer Show, Firewater Review, The Bourbon Daily, among others. And uh, if you really want to have a good time, go to Instagram and follow the hashtag ABV Network Crew. There's always all kinds of stuff happening on there, and it's a lot of fun. So anyway, thanks for listening. Peace. Oh, wait, wait, wait. One more thing. Please do us a solid and go to iTunes, rate the show. We would be extremely grateful. Thank you very much. Thanks again for listening.